I don't make teeth. I just want that understood. I even have a mug. We don't make teeth. It was a tongue-in-cheek tagline for the association added I formed, but it kind of stuck. Um, it's an inside joke. Um, everyone thinks, including family and friends, that I make teeth for a living. <laughs> Um, my mom told people all of her life that I made teeth. After the first 10 years of trying to correct her, I just started to agree with her. Yes, mom, I make teeth. Um, and then her friends started asking me for things like plates and stuff like that. And I didn't know what to do. Um, there's actually in Pennsylvania, you don't have to be a CDT, uh, to own an orthodontic lab or a dental lab. Um, I would actually fail miserably the CDT test. Um, I mean, I passed the orthodontic part with flying collars, but all the other stuff, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but I wanted to make this video a very brief history of orthodontic labs because I find it interesting. Um, and I wanted to get something out there. I should write the book eventually. Um, but I find it interesting in a geeky kind of way because with the 3D printed bands, every, everyone thinks it's a new thing for, for labs. It's actually not. Things are really just coming full circle, um, which I find interesting. So this is not a term paper. This is not a scientific discussion. This is just a shoot from the hip kind of video of things I've picked up over the years. Like I said, I've been doing this now for over 35 years. Um, I've been in labs for all of my life. I'm 52. Um, my uncle owned one of the first small labs in the Washington DC area. So I was around, it. um, I saw it and I got involved in it. So let's get into a very brief history of orthodontic labs. Everybody knows Dr. Angle, the father of modern orthodontics. It actually goes back, I did a little bit of research, and I saw something from 1863, I think, about orthodontics. Uh, dentistry and implants actually goes back to the Stone Age. Um, I saw something one time where, um, like, a couple thousand years ago, uh, they found... Um, uh, they found someone with iron or stone implants. That must have hurt. But let's talk orthodontics. So Dr. Angle opens the school. Uh, Dr. Hawley graduates from the school in 1905. Um, and he is credited with the Hawley bite plate that we all know for post-treatment retention. Um, which became the gold standard for over a hundred years um, of post-treatment retention. I think that it's still the gold standard, but I get into that in other videos and I might touch upon it in later on in this video. But so 1905. Um, the next big thing that came about in my mind and with my limited education on this <laughs> is 1943. That's when an absolute genius invented something because up until then to make a holly retainer you had to mix a monomer and a polymer um, um, a liquid and a powder to form the acrylic and then put it into a pressure pot and cook it uh, under pressure so that there's not bubbles in it so there's not air bubbles in it, but that monomer and the polymer, the acrylic, it would bond to the stone or plaster cast. So up until 1943, the models would be layered with aluminum, um, with aluminum foil strips. Yeah. But 1943, midst of a war, uh, aluminum was scarce. So some genius came out with something which is still called liquid foil. Um, I don't know the chemical composition, but instead of using strips of aluminum foil, we could just dip our paintbrush into this mixture and paint it on the cast and let it dry. And that would keep the acrylic from bonding to the cast. Uh, we still forget to do it. Everyone does it at least once, <laughs> if not twice. Um, where you go to pop the holly off of 
the stone or the plaster cast and it doesn't pop because it's seat down into it and it's basically become one piece and you destroy the model and the holy popping it off. 99% uh, of the time you have to call the doctor, apologize, say I screwed up and can you get me a new model? Now, so that was in 1943. Um, but everyone thinks now of Hawleys and Hyraxes. That's an orthodontic lab. Not the case. Or at least it was as in back then. Because back then, and really up until the 70s, um, you would have to talk to an orthodontic or dental historian about this. But most Hawleys were made in house. So that's come full circle too with the doctors making the invisible retainers in Hales, that's what all the doctors did because to become orthodontists, they had to um, learn how to make whole, whole hollies. So they would make their own hollies. That's how my uncle really started that portion of this lab. Like he would start going in to doctor's offices at night and finishing up what they couldn't get done. And then after the doctors, after the practices grew, he would eventually take on all of their work and start making all of their whole hollies. But up until the mid 70s, the majority of an orthodontic lab's output, I would say 70% of their income came from making braces. So us making bands, it's really, it's not a new thing. Because until pre-made bands came out in the mid-70s, orthodontic labs made them. So we would get the casts in from the doctors or the impression, um, cut all the teeth into individual teeth, number them. <laughs> uh, I was making a TP once and I forgot to number the teeth, which created a jigsaw puzzle for my uncle. You also only do that once. Um, especially with my uncle, you only do that once. But so we would number the teeth uh, and then make bands for every individual tooth. That was orthodontics back then, where every tooth had the metal band, including the anteriors. Um, and then we would use band material and a soldering machine, I mean a welding machine, um, and then weld the band and polish it up and then weld the brat rack, get it on and package that up for a doctor. That was the majority of the work that we did. Um, I caught the tail end of it. Um, I remember it in my uncle's lab. Um, I learned how to make a couple myself, um, but really by the time that I started getting involved in my uncle's lab, like really involved uh, in the 80s, um, most of the doctors had or almost all the, the doctors had switched to the pre-made bands, which really screwed up labs because we lost, because they lost 70% of their income. Um, and we had to switch to becoming just Hawley and Hyrax labs. And a lot of labs died because they couldn't make the switch. You try to run a business after losing 70% of your income. But orthodontics was different then too. So I came into my uncle's lab in really in the mid eighties, I guess, um, and started helping out. Even when I was a kid, I was around doctors. I was helping make deliveries and stuff like that. But um, even ortho or orthodontics, like uh, turnaround times today where they want Hawley's back and they want these things back in a couple of days, it didn't exist back then because what, because typically what would happen is the orthodontist, and I know this, and I don't know how I know this, um, but a fact stuck in my mind, it might be right, it might be wrong, but when you're doing orthodontics, of course, you are, tra you are traumatizing the roots. So once you take the braces off, they're still extremely loose. Um, they've been torqued, tugged, pulled, rotated, um, and they need time to heal. And I read somewhere that it takes 270 days for them to really heal. So that's why the standard is 24-7 wear of the Hawley or the Invisible Retainer now for the first six months. Back when I first started, it wasn't like that because most of the doctors 
As a matter of fact, all of the doctors would leave the braces on. They would make the last final adjustment and then leave the braces on for six months. Then they would take that impression with the braces on, send it to the lab, and we would carve off the brat brat brackets and the braces, um, and then make the holies on top of that so that when the person came in for their debonding appointment, they would have their holly right there. So that was really orthodontics. That was the holly and hyrax lab. Um, and then fast forward now to the present day, uh, the technology really screwed things up for us. <laughs> Um, because a lot of lab owners were like me, uh, mid forties, um, when the technology hit and we're just all planning on riding out the Holly and Hyrax lab, like we had our things. And, and I always used to tell people that if my lab burned down to the ground, um, I could start a new one with a credit card, like 10, 20 grand could really get me started. Um, or could really get me restarted. No longer the case when the technology hit. Um, I remember being in a doctor's office. Um, a doctor of mine invited me in for the salesman, the, the fancy wand salesman, <laughs> um, for his spiel. And he's talking about it, talking about scanning and all this other stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I can really see how this can improve uh, the fit um, is going to make everyone's life a lot easier. I did get into it with the salesman because he told the doctor that it was going to make everything cheaper and faster. And I'm just like, no, 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 it's not. And he called up to me and we had to talk about it. I'm like, cheaper, faster? It's not. Um, I mean, it can if you, over the long term, if you look at it the right way. But from my perspective, it was going to raise prices, and it does. Like I talked about in a previous video, a lot of doctors complain about the cost of the printed models, where the fact of the matter is, is that we were all charging a somewhat fair price, and then one company came out and undercut everybody. Um, so we all had to cut our prices. But what we're charging now, if we were to charge three times the amount we might break even on it. Because, hey, like, like I said, like 10 to 20 grand, and I could have had a new lab. Like each year I would spend, I mean, I would spend like a thousand dollars here, a couple thousand dollars there. I was a small lab, uh, four to five people. And I mean, if a big piece of equipment went down, I think the most expensive thing in the lab was the lathe, I imagine. Um, so a couple grand. Uh, air compressor, um, pressure pots. It was that kind of stuff. Then we're talking about my first printer ran me, I think it was 18,000. My second printer ran me 20,000. The software and the scanner and all of that tended to $20,000. So all of a sudden I had $150,000 in loans and I'm charging, I mean, I got to print but I'm losing money on every single one. So that was just our new reality. The return on investment was staying in business. This goes back to the 70s, um, where we had a change from, from the full orthodontic lab making braces to, to the Hawley and Hyrax lab. Now we're the Hawley and Hyrax lab and a lot of people thought of it as just a new way of getting scans. That's not the way that happened. It created an entire new department, the digital department, um, an entire new set of costs, an entire new set of expenses. So I did what I had to do. I invested. Then I went on out and helped my doctors make the transition. Then I went out and formed a national association to help other labs do the same. Um, but even back then, I was looking at the 3D metal printed bands because the truth is, is that the Europeans were far ahead of us at this because I looked into it um, because a friend of mine's in Greek Greece, I talk, talk about him a lot. So Kratis Gnidis of Gnidis Labs in Athens, 
and I don't think I'm pronouncing that right. But um, he was doing 3D printed metal bands. And I talked to him about it. I looked into it here and the prices had not come down here yet. <laughs> so a high rack would have cost about $1,000 or maybe not that much. It would have cost, I would have had to charge about like $900 for dollars. So the prices have come down a lot um, and we can now start offering them at a reasonable price. And like I said, a lot of people think it's a new thing, but to me, it's just going back to what we used to do, making bands. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. Well, I mean, if you ever have any questions or want to know anything else, just reach out to me. Uh, you can submit a request, uh, follow along. Just I geek out on this stuff from time to time. So I'll be posting other videos about various things. Um, but yeah, so Holly or Hyrax, Holly, Holly Hyrax Lab. That's what we do. But one digital models now. And the 3D printed bands, it's nothing new to us. We can make the bands. We're breaking out the welding machines again. <laughs> We're having to really learn lost arts um, of the welding, the attachments on. You can have any attachment that you want. I did run into one doctor and he seemed perplexed. Um, he was like, well, I can't get the three made the 3D printed bands because I need the attachments because I use it. And I'm just like, you can put the attachments on. We, we've been doing that now for a long, long time. But yeah, so the bands are just, they're really, they're nothing new for, 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 for us. They're just, it's a different way of doing things. Um, it's a better way of doing things, much better than their way. I mean, it's, it's guaranteed fit. There's no struggling. There's no cutting. <laughs> Uh, no forgetting to number the teeth right or anything else like that. But what's next? Um, I'm looking forward to what's next because the technology is not there yet. It hasn't even plateaued. Um, everything is still coming in leaps and bounds. Um, not as much as it once was. I mean, I'm sure that there's been various other advances and I mean, the materials is the big thing now. Um, the 3D printers um, and everything else is advancing. And, and But I don't think that it's plateaued yet. It's sort of like computers in the early 2000s where everything that you bought, uh, one month it was obsolete and a dinosaur six months afterwards. I, it's not quite that bad, but it's close. So I'm keeping an eye on things and you're more than welcome to follow along and watch me keeping an eye on things. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, I might start doing a blog at some point. No, I'm not. I'm going to continue with the YouTube channel, though. And you're welcome to follow along, and I'll be posting. But that was your brief, extremely brief history of orthodontic labs with huge gaps, I am sure. <laughs> um, I didn't even get into twin blocks, and that was part of our income as well. But, um, but yeah, so lab owners like Hawley and Hyrax, like I know that, um, I know that a doctor said that it might be important for the students to know, um, that when the invisible retainers came out and they became popular again, because like my uncle owned, um, a thermoforming machine and it sat covered in dust and he broke it out like once a year, but just when they became popular, I saw, um, say a 30 to 40% cut across the board of Hawley's because doctors were moving away from them. So I'm adjusting and all labs are adjusting while they're putting in tons of cash. So your lab guy is a pretty special guy or gal um, because they kept up with the times, they made the adjustments. Um, and it was tough for a lot of us because, like I said, we were in the Holly and Hyrax phase. We were done with change and we were just trying to coast it out until retirement. And then technology <laughs> slammed into us and said, nah, we're going to change things around. So, but that is the very brief history of Orthodontic Labs. Uh, like the video, follow along ask questions. 
Um, like I said, I just wanted to make this short one. Just uh, of course, this turns it turn is turning out to be my longest one. But anyway, have a good one. Aloha.